Looking back on those initial days, Richard found them both incredibly challenging and surprisingly easy. The uncertainty of finding a place to sleep and the overwhelming sense of despair weighed heavily on him. However, amidst the chaos, he didn't have to confront his own loneliness. Eventually, he stumbled upon a dwelling just outside of town, an abandoned house situated a mere mile from the main road. On his more desolate days, Richard would venture into town. It was during this time that he began hearing whispers about the alleged haunting of the abandoned house. Stories circulated of people vanishing when they dared to approach it too closely. Fortunately for Richard, he had not encountered any ghosts or spectral beings. He reassured himself that if he did come across such entities, he would dispatch them swiftly, just as he had done with numerous individuals who had gotten too close to the house. This routine continued for years. The longer Richard spent isolated from humanity, the more he convinced himself that he didn't need their companionship. As he distanced himself from the town, memories of his past started to consume him. The recollection of his parents slowly soured, as he grappled with the question of how they could abandon him. A rational part of Richard acknowledged the silliness of blaming his parents. They hadn't chosen to perish in the fire, nor had they chosen to leave him behind. These thoughts led him to ponder Joseph as well, harboring the same resentment toward him as he did toward his parents. Why hadn't Joseph defended him? Why hadn't he spoken up and assured everyone that it wasn't Richard's fault? Yet, these moments of anger would pass, and Richard would arrive at the understanding that Joseph had no choice. Richard had bitten his friend. Nonetheless, a part of him longed for Joseph to have done or said something, to have shown him care. Richard yearned to see Joseph again, but the fear of hearing Joseph dismiss him and bring his darkest fears to life was overpowering. The fear that Joseph had never cared for him at all proved to be too much. Years elapsed, and Richard continued to be alone. It had likely been months since he last visited town. His clothes had become too tight, and his shoes bore holes. He needed new ones, and by new, he meant entering the homes of families and taking lightly used garments. He remained smaller than he should be, as children seemed to grow at an astonishing pace. Richard had to seek out new families as they outgrew him. That night was a new family, a new layout, marking a departure from his usual routine. As he surreptitiously entered the home, something caught his attention. The child in the room appeared to be his own age, yet Richard knew the child was much younger. He couldn't pinpoint why, but he stood over the child's bed, inexplicably at ease in that room, at that moment. The child looked so familiar. Lost in his trance, Richard failed to notice the door opening behind him or the man stealthily approaching with a crowbar in hand. It was only when the crowbar collided with his jaw, knocking him to the ground, that he realized he was not alone. Frantically, Richard scrambled backward, but in his panic, he moved in the wrong direction, finding himself cornered by the man who now stood between him and any escape route. The man raised the crowbar again, poised to strike, until his arm fell to his side. Richard? Drawing closer, now illuminated by the window's light, Richard could discern the man's features, dark circles under his eyes, graying hair, but he immediately recognized him. Richard cautiously rose to his feet, unsure of how this encounter would unfold. There was no denying it, the man before him was Joseph. What art thou doing here? Joseph barked, his grip tightening on the crowbar, his eyes scrutinizing Richard with skepticism. I, I just. It had been years since Richard engaged in conversation, and the words felt foreign and out of place. Tears welled up, and despite his efforts to restrain them, they flowed uncontrollably. He missed his old friend, but the intensity of their reunion overwhelmed him. I prithee, I asked, what art thou doing here? Joseph reiterated, his grip on the crowbar tightening, his knuckles turning white. I, I sought but new habiliments, Richard managed to utter through his sobs. These ones be too small, riddled with holes, and I'm oft left shivering in the cold. Unintentionally, Richard unleashed a torrent of his innermost thoughts and emotions. Every lonesome night, every hardship he had endured, all spilled out in an incoherent ramble. It was at this moment that Joseph noticed the crowbar in his hand slackening. Ere they comprehended the unfolding events, Richard lunged at him, driven by an impulse he couldn't fully grasp. Their bodies collided, and for a fleeting second, Richard was uncertain of the outcome. Would he strike Joseph? Yet, instead, Richard found his arms encircling the man, broader and stouter than his recollection, yet still emanating warmth. I'm so alone, Richard sobbed into Joseph's chest. In that transient moment, the crowbar in Joseph's grip tightened momentarily ere slipping from his hand, clattering to the ground. Joseph reciprocated, enfolding Richard tightly.
How dost thou still retain thy youthfulness? Joseph inquired, drawing Richard's face away from his chest, endeavoring to obtain a clearer gaze. The ensuing days felt akin to a reverie. Joseph had insisted that Richard partake in a bath and don fresh attire. Once his wife stirred from slumber, she adamantly insisted that they grant Richard a prolonged stay. However, Joseph imposed a condition upon him, Richard was to refrain from revealing the true nature of their acquaintance. Instead, he was to convey that his father had been a childhood friend of Joseph's, who had vanished without a trace. This directive left Richard apprehensive. It meant that he would eventually have to depart once they began to take notice of his lack of growth. Yet, he comprehended Joseph's reasoning, his wife might not understand. For the present, however, he relished the warmth of their abode, the comfort of clean clothes, and the solace of companionship. Quickly, Richard found solace in the company of Joseph's son during the day. Come nightfall, he would spend time conversing with Joseph, who had ascended to a position of esteem within the city and the church. Together, they delved into discussions about faith and the notion that God had a predetermined plan for each individual, even one such as Richard. Years elapsed, and Richard remained untouched by the passage of time. Anxieties besieged him, fearing that Margaret, Joseph's wife, would grow concerned and perceive him as an agent of evil. Yet, instead of harboring apprehension, she ascribed his stunted growth to his prolonged solitude. Fret not, Richard, she would utter in the most soothing tone he had ever encountered. One day, thou shalt experience a growth spurt. Each day, Richard harbored trepidation, dreading the prospect of Margaret discerning his slower maturation. Time exhibited its peculiar nature, unfurling with breathtaking celerity. The sole reminder of its swift progression resided in Joseph's son, who transformed from a child of equal age to Richard upon his arrival into an almost fuller-grown adult. Nevertheless, Margaret appeared blissfully unaware, as if time's effects eluded her notice. In truth, the entire family seemed oblivious to this remarkable disparity. One day, as Richard sat at the dining room table, immersed in biblical passages, an activity that both soothed and unsettled him, Margaret settled herself beside him. She often sought this respite amidst her daily chores, but today felt different. He discerned it in her gaze. Thou knowest, Joseph claims thou art the offspring of a friend from his youth. Yet, I dare say, I find that explanation dubious. Richard froze in terror, yet confusion clouded his mind. This sort of revelation typically sparked ire, but Margaret emanated a sense of serenity as she spoke. As Richard summoned the courage to meet her gaze, he was met not with anger or fear, but with a radiant smile. Margaret's hand tenderly clasped his arm, her smile growing even more luminous. Thou knowest, I initially believed thee to be of the same age as my son. Yet, he has blossomed into a man, while thou retainest the graceful beauty of youth. Her hand ascended his arm, traversing his neck, gently caressing his earlobe. A surge of guilt coursed through Richard's being, causing his body to stiffen. I cannot help but perceive thy beauty, she whispered, her fingers entwining within his locks of hair. It doth not feel amiss to acknowledge this, for I am aware, beyond doubt, that thou art far older than mine own son. Richard feigned obliviousness to the implications of her words, yet his face flushed with an intense heat. He endeavoured to suppress any emotions she sought to stir within him, but her relentless remarks about his allure made the task increasingly arduous. Her intentions gradually became apparent, as she walked her legs around his body, causing Richard to startle. Thou knowest, I cherish my husband, but he is no longer youthful and comely as thou art. Richard's instinct for self-preservation surged within him, and he attempted to extricate himself from Margaret's grasp. However, to his dismay, she possessed an unexpected strength that belied her appearance. With one hand restraining him and the other forcefully tugging at his garments, Richard struggled in a desperate bid for freedom. As Richard's attempts to resist proved futile, he found himself engulfed by her advances. A torrent of conflicting emotions raged within him. This was not right, he silently admonished himself. She was a married woman, and he was not her husband. He found himself trapped in a disconcerting limbo, oscillating between a strange blend of pleasure and resentment. Her grasp tightened around his jaw a menacing reminder of the consequences should he divulge their illicit liaison. Her words pierced his gut like daggers, instilling a profound sense of dread and vulnerability. That very night, Richard made a concerted effort to evade Joseph's presence. He harbored the notion that by simply avoiding him for a few days, he could quell the memories that plagued his mind. However, to his dismay, Margaret's advances persisted relentlessly, stretching out over the passing years. This unceasing cycle of guilt and shame weighed heavily upon Richard's conscience. 
he sought solace in delving deeper into his own thoughts, seeking refuge within the pages of sacred scriptures. There, he found both a source of solace and a reminder of his transgressions, causing his emotions to become intertwined in an intricate web of comfort and self-reproach. Years passed, and with each passing day, Richard felt increasingly ensnared within the confines of Joseph's abode. Neither of them permitted him to venture far, keeping a watchful eye over him. In one aspect, residing with them provided him with the convenience of obtaining sustenance without worry. However, Margaret's presence made life nearly unbearable, burdening him with an incessant feeling of sin. At times, Richard wondered if seeking sustenance on his own would have felt less morally reprehensible. Thus, as he stood alongside Joseph, both beholding Margaret's lifeless form within the coffin, no emotion stirred within him. Instead, a mixture of contempt and relief coursed through his veins, knowing she would no longer be part of their lives. This unexpected reaction drew forth Joseph's accusing words, spoken with a sneer of disdain, labeling Richard a heartless creature. She provided thee with shelter for years, Joseph seethed, his face contorted with anger. She deemed thee family, despite knowing thy unearthly nature. How canst thou gaze upon her without remorse? Turning to face Joseph, Richard met his anger with a defiant gaze. She bestowed upon me a dwelling I did not seek. And her blindness to mine true nature does not absolve her of her own transgressions. With a heavy sigh, Richard returned his attention to the coffin, observing as Joseph tenderly pressed a kiss upon Margaret's hand before gently placing it back within the confines of the wooden vessel. In that very moment, the priest approached them, his countenance filled with pity for Joseph. Were the proper last rites conducted upon her departure? Joseph remained silent, yet the desperation in his eyes spoke volumes. Canst thou perform them now, he implored, his voice thick with grief. Regrettably, the priest shook his head. I doth declare, I canst only offer mine assistance whilst one dwelleth amongst the living. She was snatched from us with undue haste. So she art not. Joseph's voice trailed off, his gaze fixated on his departed wife, tears welling in his eyes. Unable to bear witness to Joseph's anguish, Richard spoke up, his voice tinged with indignation. How canst thou utter such words? His wife hath just departed, and now thou suggests he shall never lay eyes upon her again. Anger surged within Richard, a protective instinct rising to the surface. Despite his own troubled memories of Margaret, he could empathize with the shattering pain Joseph would endure if aught were to befall her. I fear it is beyond mine power, the priest responded, bowing his head in a manner of regret. To fulfill such a request, thou would require a sin eater. For a fleeting moment, a glimmer of hope flickered within Joseph's eyes. And where might we procure one, he inquired eagerly. However, the glimmer was short-lived, as the priest expounded upon the societal scorn faced by sin-eaters. Assuming the burden of others' transgressions, both in life and in death, condemned the individual to an existence haunted by wickedness. None wished to keep company with such a person. With those samba words, the priest took his leave, departing from the chamber and leaving the two men alone with Margaret's lifeless form, a vessel stained with the weight of her sins. The tension in the air hung heavy, but its weight was fleeting. Before Richard could grasp the unfolding events, Joseph lunged upon him, a mixture of anger and sorrow etched upon his countenance. The unspoken plea reverberated between them, and Richard understood all too well what Joseph sought from him. Never before had Richard denied Joseph anything, but now he stood at a precipice of moral turmoil. How could he comply with such a request? He was privy to Margaret's transgressions, aware of the darkness that shrouded her past, and perhaps even deeper shadows yet undiscovered. He did not wish to shoulder that burden upon himself. Feebly attempting to articulate his reluctance, Richard's words faltered and dissolved into incoherence. The sorrow in Joseph's eyes dissipated, replaced by a simmering resentment. After all the years I sheltered thee, he uttered, the words laden with accusation. The force of Joseph's grip on Richard's shoulders propelled him downward, crashing onto the floor. Thou art a murderer. I invited thee into my home to abate the deaths thou hath wrought upon this world. And how dost thou repay me? By bedding my wife. Believe not that I was unaware of thy indiscretions, tears streamed down Joseph's face. Thou art unworthy of salvation. Thou art already headed for damnation. If our friendship ever held any worth to thee, thou shalt fulfill this duty for me. Memories of Richard's sordid past surged forth, piercing his heart with a searing pain. In a voice barely above a whisper, Richard finally found the strength to respond. I shall do as thou ask for thy sake. Joseph's grip loosened, and he collapsed into Richard's embrace.
thank thee, he murmured, his cheek grazing against Richard's. In that moment, Richard's mind became a battleground of conflicting emotions. Joseph's words resonated deep within him, for he was acutely aware of the irreparable sins that stained his past. And within those fleeting moments, as Joseph lay atop him, a strange sense of peace enveloped Richard. Amidst the muddled chaos of his thoughts, he pondered the course of events that Margaret had put him through. Would he have felt the same sense of disgust if it had been Joseph? As the years unfold, Richard found himself immersed in the role of a full-time sin-eater, an arrangement struck with Joseph to secure his place within their household. In exchange, Joseph dutifully furnished the blood that sustained Richard's precarious existence. Yet, with the passage of time, Richard's guilt and self-reproach grew ever deeper, festering within him like an incurable malady. He cloaked his true identity behind the visage of a plague doctor, a constant reminder of the burden he bore. Already shunned by society, Richard knew he must conceal this aspect of himself, for he was already deemed a peculiar outcast, avoided by all. But it was not solely for this reason that he hid. The blood Joseph procured for him never felt quite sufficient. He resorted to drinking from the very souls he prayed over. The mask brought solace, assuring him that even if someone were to fathom his deeds, they would never glimpse his countenance. It allowed him to maintain a semblance of control, although he was certain that this further compounded the sins he absorbed. Joseph stood as the sole figure in Richard's life. However, as the years rolled on, Joseph aged and increasingly relied upon Richard's caretaking. Following Margaret's demise, Joseph withdrew, growing more distant by the day. This silent withdrawal inflicted a pain upon Richard he was reluctant to confess, though he could not blame Joseph entirely. Whenever Richard contemplated addressing their deteriorating relationship, he could only envision Joseph's tear-filled eyes. The knowledge of how deeply he had wounded Joseph and the irrevocable nature of his transgressions rendered him incapable of offering recompense. Above all, he believed Joseph deserved to harbor such feelings of resentment. Yet, a time arrived when Richard knew a conversation could no longer be postponed, regardless of the torment it might unleash. Having spent years in close proximity to death, Richard had become acutely attuned to its presence, sensing the dense darkness and discernible scent it emanated. In the dead of night, Richard crept into Joseph's room, the very chamber where he spent most of his weary days now. He settled beside Joseph's bed, his heart fluttering with trepidation. He hesitated to rouse him, fearing that inaction might lead to irreversible consequences. With his head bowed low and hands trembling, Richard offered a silent prayer, seeking solace within himself. From the bed, Joseph's voice, laden with raspiness, pierced the silence. Do not waste your time, he scoffed, his eyes glaring at Richard. I have no desire for a demon to beseech on my behalf. Joseph's words cut Richard deeply, revealing the extent to which his own hurt had failed to remain concealed. Do not pretend you are unaware of your true nature, Joseph retorted. I am not a demon, Richard replied, his conviction wavering. You are not but a demon, and were I privy to the means of your demise, I would have orchestrated it long ago, Joseph declared, his tone laden with loathing. Richard's hands fell helplessly to his side. You cannot truly mean that, he pleaded, his voice tinged with desperation. I do. I despise you. I always have, Joseph spat, the strain of his cough resonating through the room. It commenced the night you took the life of that lad, and I, in my folly, aided in its concealment. The guilt burdened me, and I confessed to the priest, who ordained that my penance be to watch over you. To sate your hunger with swine's blood and prevent you from causing harm to others. The revelation left Richard utterly aghast, unable to fathom the veracity of Joseph's accusations. It couldn't be true. Joseph couldn't genuinely mean his venomous words. The pain seared through him, threatening to consume his very being. Moments later, Joseph began to choke, prompting Richard to rise swiftly. Attempting to offer him water, he was met with a swift rejection. I desire naught from you, you wretched demon, Joseph bellowed, recounting Richard's sins with an unyielding fervor. The accusations persisted until they abruptly fell silent. Richard stood frozen in the room, his heart heavy with a mix of emotions. The weight of Joseph's hatred and the burden of his own sins bore down upon him like a crushing force. He couldn't help but feel a profound sense of loss, not just for Joseph's passing, but for the shattered illusion of their relationship. As the stench of death lingered in the air, tears welled up in his eyes as he confronted the stark reality of his existence. He had become a vessel of sin, condemned to carry the weight of his own transgressions and the sins of others. At that moment, Richard made a silent vow. He would no longer be a pawn in the game of others.
he would shed the guilt that had consumed him. With a heavy heart, Richard closed Joseph's lifeless eyes and whispered a prayer, asking for forgiveness, not only for himself but for Joseph as well. Thank <laughs> you.